The McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, covering monetary, economic, and geopolitical news events. Now, here are Kevin Oreck and David McIlvaney. Welcome to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. David, yesterday you came in after a great holiday away. I mean, I know you had gone out of town again and had a great Thanksgiving, but you just had this pale green look on your face. and The stock market was up 300 points. Was it the food? No, you know, we had a great time visiting with family, fantastic food. And what evolved last week, while we were thinking about turkey and stuffing and family time together, right. was the complete implosion in Europe. Wednesday, you have a failed bond auction in Germany. And how much press does it get Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday? As we come into the new market open on Monday, there is grave concern about the dissolution of the Eurozone in its totality, not just losing Greece, and you've got Merkel and Sarkozy trying to patch some sort of a a last-ditch effort, conference, this, that, and the other. And guess what? Retail sales were great on Friday. We had a great flat Friday. Dave, I mean, why wouldn't spending more money when we don't have it? Be good news. Kevin, I guess what scares me is that people really aren't engaged. If people think that spending $52 billion of money that you don't have on credit cards to just feel like you're doing all right again is somehow a revival of, of new growth in the economy. Right. I'm all for improved retail sales. I'm all for retailers doing well. This is not a bah humbug moment. Okay. Right. I'm not Scrooge, but this is the issue. We've got people who are spending money that they don't have, and it's really reminiscent of what the government's doing. Right. They're spending money that they don't have. And the whole crisis that we have in Europe and in the U.S., it's the same theme over and over again, and it doesn't matter whether it's Main Street, Wall Street, or the folks in Washington, D.C., or any power center around the world. It seems that the problem and the solution are utterly confused because the problem was spending money that we didn't have, and now what are they doing more of? Spending money that we don't have. Well, David, it reminds me, and this is not necessarily a partisan issue, it reminds me of 2001 when Bush was saying it's patriotic to go spend money because of 9-11. We need to get the Americans activated, go spend money. It just shows how tight Keynesian economics has gripped even a public who's never heard of John Maynard Keynes. It's all about spending more money and good news, even though disposable income, Dave, I think was down over 2% from year to year. The disposable income was not there to make a Black Friday or even, what do they call it, Cyber Monday a better day. Kevin, my thoughts were bordering on the paranoid coming in on Monday because, you know, my sort of crisis checklist was being put in place Sunday night. Right. Moving into crisis mode, I'm thinking about bank deposits, limiting them, checking the latest safety rating of my bank. I'm thinking about insurance companies, limiting exposure to insurance companies and making sure that I'm with the most credible, if with an insurance company at all. Pension funds, do I have the option of a lump sum? Take it and run, if that's the case. Literally, I'm coming in Monday morning thinking this is a time to be battening down the hatches, and instead the market goes nuts, berserk, absolutely ecstatic, because guess what? There's an indication of a pulse with the consumer. And I'm just thinking to myself, really, guys, this is as deep as it gets. And some of the quotes that were coming out of Europe and England were basically saying, we may be days or weeks away from the end of the Eurozone. So people really are not connecting the dots. Now, I want to jump back, though, David, because even though we talk about the economy a lot, we do say the the financial moves to the economic, moves to the political, and then it goes to the geopolitical. Now, Iran, things are happening right now in Iran. It may not be to Americans, but it's to our allies, Britain, right now. Well, Kevin, the the song, It Only Takes a Spark to Get a Fire Going. (laughs) On Sunday, you've got the Iranian parliament, and they voted to expel the British ambassador and reduce diplomatic relations with the UK. And and then here we are on Tuesday morning, you've got the embassy releasing a statement, and they said this, the British said, there's been an incursion by a significant number of demonstrators into our embassy premises, including vandalism to our property. This is a fluid situation and details are still emerging. We're outraged by this, it's utterly unacceptable, and we condemn it. Under international law, including the Vienna Convention, the Iranian government have a clear duty to protect diplomats and embassies in their country 
and we expect them to act urgently to bring the situation under control and ensure the safety of our staff and security of our property. It was an Iranian news agency, Kevin, that ran the story and then immediately retracted it that six embassy staff had been taken hostage. Boy. So that leaves it unconfirmed. On the one hand, you've got the Iranian news agency saying it, and then obviously you've got a situation which would escalate to the next level in terms of an international flashpoint if, in fact, we've got something reminiscent of the 1979 hostage crisis where instead of the U.K., instead of the British citizens being taken hostage today, we're talking about U.S. citizens in what was an absolute disaster for the Carter administration. Well, and David, there's such an irony here because Ahmadinejad was one of those students back in the late 70s, and now he's president of Iran. So to think that he's going to be just deeply concerned about an embassy being stormed, gosh, this guy's bio. Student political activism seems to be a great lead-in to a political career. Yeah, so David, if we are talking about the 1970s, we're talking about a period of time of high inflation, gold rising, invasion from Russia. Okay, we're also talking about the Iranian hostage crisis. There seems to be some parallels. And so David, to bring it back to the economic in the 1970s, a similar type of period of time, interest rates were skyrocketing because of inflation. Now, that's not something we're seeing right now. We, we saw a failed German bond auction. You mentioned it earlier last week. Well, and just to make sure we're not confusing causal behavior, because it's not that inflation was driving interest rates, mm. but interest rates were rising to take care of inflation. To get that a was, positive rate of return. That was, I mean, essentially you're talking about risk premium. If you assume that you're going to lose value through a devalued currency, how do you make some of that back? Right. You have to have some compensation for losses that you're taking if you're willing to commit capital. And that's when you begin to see an increase in interest rates where people are saying, I'm viewing risk in this category or that category. Maybe it is interest rate fluctuation. Maybe it is currency devaluation. Maybe it is political instability. Maybe it is your ability to collect taxes as revenues. That's been the crisis in Greece. They have now a dual crisis. Not only do they have too much debt, but they have no means of collecting revenue to pay and service their debt. So you've got all of these things which can drive interest rates higher in the only place in Europe where you've seen stability in the bond market. The safe haven. The safe haven, right. just like the U.S. Treasury market, but for Europe. Was the German Bund. That's exactly yeah. right. And what does it tell you when last Wednesday you have a failed bond auction? You've got several billion dollars, six billion euros at offer, and close to three billion of it doesn't go. So they sold just a little over half. Now, here's the thing, too, and we ought to talk about this yeah, for the understanding of the bond market. percent was not taken. It had to be monetized. Well, if you don't sell bonds at the interest rate that you're willing to pay, let's say you're the German Bundesbank, okay, you have two choices. You can either raise the interest rates that you're willing to pay, which it seems the Germans were not willing to do last Wednesday, or just buy it back from yourself. Now, that's something we in the United States have experienced for far too long with the Federal Reserve. Is Germany monetizing? They are monetizing. And when you look at the Bundesbank, you go back to December 07. December 07. And right. keep in mind, we have an assumption about the stability of the Germans, the German banking system, and what was the old Deutsche Mark, and hopefully their influence in the euro as the largest component part in the ECB, a 27% contributor to the ECB. Right. They are the largest vote, if you will, with the European Central Bank. And they're considered the strong backbone. But the issue is we perceive them as such right. only because we, you and I, have the historical recollection of the hyperinflation and assume that they do too. Right. We're now moving into multiple generations' distance from those events and a failure of collective memory. Kevin, going back to that December 07 date, we find the Bundesbank with a leverage ratio of 75 to 1, not exactly the pristine, conservative, non-money printing, non-accommodating bank that they've postured and advertised themselves to be. So they were already highly leveraged back in 2007 before the crisis. Where are they at now? Well, that's, of course, they keep on taking over these responsibilities, a cleanup operation, if you will. German bonds aren't bought. Where do they go? Who's buying them? How do they get monetized? 
that does impact your balance sheet. Now they're not 75 to 1, they're 153 to 1. And we still have this impression that they are the conservative, tried, true, stayed. Surely they have not forgotten the social ramifications and consequences of hyperinflation. Well, let's put this in context for the person who owns a home. Let's say you own a home for $153,000. And you say, well, how much do I need to put down to buy this home? Or you don't own it yet, but you're trying to buy it. And they say, well, just Bring in a thousand bucks, one hundred and fifty-three to one. We're comfortable with. And if it moves down in value, one thousand dollars, your equity is wiped out. You're done. Yeah. So virtually no change in the value of the assets on your balance sheet, and you're insolvent. And this is the irony, Kevin, because the Bundesbank, being the strong anchor within the ECB, is on thin, thin, thin ice. Kevin, we've got December 9th coming up in the European Summit, which features a treaty restructuring for the ease of fiscal integration. Sarkozy and Merkel are trying to say, how do we push this forward? We're now at that crunch time where we're not sure there's any other solution except fiscal integration. Explain the ramifications of fiscal union. I mean, what makes that different for the listener who's not familiar with the monetary union that they have now? Well, Kevin, essentially what it is is a handover to Berlin of control of all of Europe. And that may sound extreme, but we basically are witnessing the potential winning of World War II by the Germans in terms of the transfer of power and influence over all of Europe. How many people fought and died to keep that from happening? Obviously, the circumstances were different then from now. We're talking about different leadership. We're talking about a different mandate, a different ideal being foisted on the world then versus now. But this is the idea, Kevin, that we have very limited options, and it is either to shrink the euro considerably Mm. or to see deeper integration. And shrinking would be, to some degree, admitting defeat. So there is a pride issue. There is, there's many, many complicating factors, but they're not going to shrink it. It appears that they're moving towards fiscal integration. And isn't it interesting, David? It's so important to have a rearview mirror look at history when you're looking at what's in front of you, because we just now talked about, isn't it strange that Akman Adinejad, who runs Iran, was part of those student protests and the, the capture of hostages back in the late 70s? We also have to look back in the mirror and go, now Germany wanted what is happening back in the 40s, in the 30s, and we're seeing it, however, brought about by monetary crisis. We're not saying there's anything wrong with Berlin calling the shots. We're just saying that Berlin is calling the shots, and that's what it means. So if you have a problem with that, then you do. If you don't, then you don't. But that is what it means. Fiscal integration means at this point that France and Germany, again, what what Ian McCavity said was the Frank and Stein monster coming together, it actually is more the Stein than the Frank, because they are the ones who are the largest contributors to the ECB, and you have to follow the money on that. So, David, until we see that fiscal union or until we see some clarity, what is it that you recommend people do? Well, I think you have to learn to wait, Kevin. I think we're in the stage of right now is battening down the hatches for a European storm, and it's important that people be positioned ahead of the storm and then just have the ability to be patient. That's so hard. Well, Kevin, you you went out to New York, and just before Hurricane Irene hit New York, you were there sort of preparing and helping your daughter get ready. Cans of tuna, water, batteries for the flashlights. And then when everything was done and you had gotten ready... Then there was nothing. There was nothing more to do. And it was strange because they say 12 million people roughly live in New York. Well, these people are doing things all the time. It's why you live in New York. You don't not do something. But they shut New York down on Saturday afternoon. I think I mentioned this in a prior program. And the only thing you could do, there was no wind. The only thing you could do was just sort of walk around and wait because we knew Irene was going to come 8 o'clock that next morning. I mean, the weather service told us exactly when it would be there. It was supposed to be one of the worst storms in history to hit New York. You know, thank the Lord it wasn't. But nonetheless, that waiting, you don't know what to do with yourself. Now, if a person has money or assets in an account and they're just chomping at the bit to move them around, this is the time frame in which the fundamentals will ultimately speak. Yeah. But the question is, when you begin to see the market react to those fundamentals, you have no idea. That's what you cannot judge. And this is to borrow from a Keynesian idea, which I, ha- I think has some relevance. He's saying the market operates this way. It's like a beauty contest. And you don't choose, when you're an investor, the most beautiful woman in the beauty contest. You choose what 
you think other people will view as the most beautiful woman in the beauty contest. So you're investing for perception, not necessarily reality. That's right. So the reality already exists in terms of the very frail, frail market structure, both in Europe and in the United States. But the perception is that all is well. And we come into this week with a sense that all is well, that retail sales were up. This bodes very well. And if you recall, Kevin, corporations were very wise, I think, several months ago to not be overstocking shelves. Right. You remember we talked about what was happening in the Long Beach port and what was happening all up and down the West Coast as Longshoremen basically had nothing to do. This is very uncommon coming into the holiday season, but you had purchasing managers say, we don't see it, we don't think it's going to happen, we think this is going to be a very slow season. And statistically, Kevin, when you come out of the gates strongest in a selling season, like this last weekend, typically you've already seen the best already. Ready, and you've got a very negative taper from that point forward. Well, what a contrast, though. I keep hopping back across the Atlantic, but, you know, during the time that we were doing our Black Friday shopping, or, or the people who were out, the weekend news from Europe was the worst since 2008. I mean, it's like a subprime crisis occurring all over again. Yeah, you know, you've got the British embassies in the Eurozone, which have been instructed to do scenario planning for helping expats through a collapse of the single currency. So an expat who's maybe living in Greece, or living in in Portugal or Italy or Spain I mean, right. where, where they are they're now doing scenario planning to figure out okay what do we need to do if there's a collapse in the currency if we see countries begin to leave and this is an eminent thing their concern is that this could happen within weeks or months and you may have a stranded expat community without access to bank accounts and liquidity because they no longer have via their credit cards or debit cards the ability to move the ability to purchase things the ability to exist as they had previously so it's the British taking care of their own. You know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of a financial Dunkirk, preparing for Dunkirk. That's when Hitler blitzkrieged across Europe, and Britain basically got their people out of Dunkirk in just a nick of time. Well, and I think it's very interesting, Kevin, that you've got the British embassies doing that scenario planning now. You've got ICAP PLC, which is a large firm facilitating settlement of currency trades between banks. They're testing systems for trading the old European currencies. Kevin, these are stress tests in the event of a member state exiting and going back to their old currency, where they would be responsible, this company who's responsible in large part for the settlement of currency transactions in Europe, they would have to then get more creative, go back to the old ways of doing business, and converting between one, two, three, four, five, ten currencies, but at least having one new variable in the mix. Okay, so if someone's planning for the scenarios that could occur with Europe, I think it's been distilled by Jim Bianco down to three things. The first one would be to just disband the currency completely. Right? Is that something that you see happening, David? Kevin, the disbanding, I mean, you, you've got these two strong interests. You've got the folks who've had a vision of a unified Europe since 1950 who will not, they are like bulldogs in terms of their tenacity. Right. They will not let go of this idea. And I think they'd be willing to sacrifice anything to keep that union, including inflation. Yeah. Including inflation. It's a small price to pay, and it's a temporary price to pay for something that takes decades to plan and execute on in terms of political change. So, Kevin, I think this is where you go back to Frank Biancari's interview when we talked to him about the fact that crisis compresses time. Right. And this, for them, speeds up the opportunity for a deeper integration. No, I don't think you see countries leave. Now, that's one element. You're talking about the powered elite in Europe holding on to a vision of Europe and not letting go of it until they have absolutely succeeded. At the other end of the political spectrum are not the powerful elite. You're talking about the grassroots. You're talking about the unemployed. You're talking right. about folks who may vote. Well, Kevin, this is the point. You've got the democratic element. You've got the people who want to be enfranchised. One man, one vote, one election. Right. They will have their voice heard, and they would say to themselves, we're not being fairly represented. It appears that we're paying the price and someone else is benefiting, whether that's the banking class, whether that's the political elite, whether that's the... I mean, this is sort of the theme of the Occupy Wall Street, but writ large globally, it's just the unenfranchised people who do still have a vote and get to say... I'd rather have the peseta. I'd rather have the lira. I'd rather have the drachma than stick with the euro and be the whipping boy for the Germans. That, again, is not our opinion, but that would be the opinion of the disenfranchised, non-working, unemployed, whether you're Italian, whether you're Greek, you're Spanish, who are saying, 
we'd give anything to leave. So you've yeah. got that struggle, Kevin, of the powerful elite and the disenfranchised who do carry a vote and live in a democracy coming into conflict. Well, and that conflict probably comes from the second solution. I mean, the second solution is austerity. Who feels the pain during austerity? Is it the rich or the poor? It really is the people that feel austerity. Yeah. And so that's where you begin to see the electorate hit the streets. Yeah. That's where if you're going to do this to us, it's, it's one thing to be unemployed and feel like you can't make ends meet because of inflation. You still don't have a person to point the finger at. But when you begin to implement austerity measures, now you've got a party to blame, you've got a persona to blame, and that's when you can take to the street. That's when you can get either uptight or actually violent. And that's where we see the second option, that of massive austerity, as off the table. Because sure. politicians are not willing to be that tarred and feathered character marched out in the political parade. Well, and it's almost impossible to have austerity when you're, let's say, a Greek leader, like you said, or a Spanish leader. But if you have a single fiscally united union, now I don't know how that happens, but that's the third option. If they fiscally unite, that's what you talked about, everything being run through Berlin, do you see that that could possibly bring about a long-term solution? Or would it be a smaller Europe, like we've talked about before, a smaller European Union, maybe getting rid of the uh, excess weight? Well, Kevin, and this is Jim Bianco with Bianco Research has done a great job talking about these three issues, these three elements. And, and the issue with that third one, Kevin, a fiscal union, is that it is essentially a way of saying that Germany wins World War II. Right. And, and that is something that ultimately I think there would be a gut check to. Kevin, essentially what you're talking about is a rewriting of the script because they only allowed for the giving up of monetary sovereignty, to right. give up fiscal sovereignty, Fiscal sovereignty, what is fiscal? What does that mean? We use that word a lot. Just to refresh, that's when someone can tax you and then take that revenue and spend it. They're the decision makers and not only how deep they can get into your pockets, but what they can do with that money on the other side. So what you're talking about is the Italians saying, somebody in some other country is going to pick my pocket and spend it on their pet projects don't like it. Or you have somebody in Greece saying the same thing happening. I don't want the Italians picking my pocket and spending it on their road projects. Right. Or you've got the Portuguese. It goes on and on and on, Kevin, but where you don't have any sense of accountability for the leadership that you elected to represent you in the political structure. How is the money being taxed and spent? Now it is out of your hands under a consolidated fiscal union, which implies fiscal union one step towards political union. Once again, you're listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary at McIlvaney.com, M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y.com. You know, I think about Rome, David, because the last time we saw this region actually unite was under Rome, but there was no fiscal unification based on peaceful treaties and, and meetings in December. Okay? It was a double-edged sword. Yeah, That's absolutely. what got it done. It was the Roman military and a whole lot of bloodshed, and it took a lot of blood to continue to keep that thing together as long as they did. Now, so what you're saying, if we do have a fiscal union, what you're saying is a Greek by birth, but a European by not your choice, or a Spaniard by birth but a European not by choice, because you're talking about no vote on this. This is something that would be brought down from the top. Yeah, and Kevin, when people feel disenfranchised, they do everything that they can to get re-enfranchised. I mean, you've had this with the Basque separatist movement. You've had this with, if you want to go back and look at European history and the different f factions that represented, quote-unquote, terrorists, whether that was the IRA in Ireland or, again, the Black September, or I mean, there's all of these groups, Kevin, which had a particular view and felt like they needed to be enfranchised and the existing government did not adequately represent their interests. What you're talking about is, is immediately creating the possibility for total chaos, wherein you've got these individual factions who are saying, not on our watch, not on my dime. This doesn't represent me. We're a democracy and you're not respecting my vote. If you won't respect my vote, then I won't respect your right to X, Y, and Z. And that's where you end up with total political chaos, verging on anarchy, Kevin, but where I think the anarchy of tomorrow is designed right. and is orchestrated, and I want to know who's behind the scenes. Who will take advantage of that groundswell of, of energy. Well, let me throw this out to you, because you've brought up many times these guys we call bond vigilantes. Okay, And I've asked you, what is a bond vigilante? But it really is the bond market is so huge in comparison to stock markets, commodity markets, you name it. The bond market is the world's money system. And it's smarter but than the equity market. And last well. week, the bond vigilantes talk about anarchy. They said, no, we're not going to take the strongest bond in Europe. We're not going to take the German bond. Now, tell me this week, I mean, Italy 
has two bond auctions this week. Okay. Well, if the bond vigilantes didn't want the European Union's strongest country, how about Italy? And we've already seen it, Kevin. I mean, that, that's so the first one's done. We've got one more later this week. Kevin, essentially, we have the potential for triggering the credit markets into an utter debt panic this week, next week. In fact, you could go week by week between now and the end of the year. Kevin, the Italian Treasury issued $7.5 billion worth of bonds earlier this week, and they've got a similar offering later this week. What's particularly interesting about the $7.5 billion offering is it was only a week to 10 days ago that the news in the U.S. was, gracious me, rates are at 7%. We've got to do something to get them under 7%. There's panic in the Italian market. The bond vigilantes are at work again. There's right. chaos. We've got to do something. Where's the ECB to intervene? Guess what it was this week, Kevin? Just shy of 8%. Okay, so it's going up, and that's what's supposed to happen when risk increases. Right, but that is that is what is emerging, Kevin, is the facade of stability is being torn down, and people are saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, it's not just the Italians that have wrecked their financial house. The Germans have done the same thing. And that's why you had the absolute failure of the bond market last week in Germany. This is the critical turning point in the European crisis. Last week was the critical turning point in the European crisis because of the failed German bond auction. Kevin, it would be like us coming to market with $20 billion here in the U.S. and having a no-show by the Chinese, having a no-show by the Japanese, having a no-show by the institutions here in the U.S. On top of this, Kevin, we had U.S. money market funds who had been funding Europe up until last week pull $8 billion in short-term funding. So you've got European banks who've been, again, financed in the short term by U.S. institutions, and you've got U.S. institutions, money market managers saying, wow, this is going from bad to worse, and we're going to have some serious egg on face if we don't stop our bad buying habits and get some of that money back on our side of the pond. David, it doesn't sound like December is going to be a very merry time for Europeans. And as it's far going as, to be a both time of giving and receiving. It's a time of gifts and, and great hope and expectation that perhaps something is given as well. Well, <laughs> you know, if, I think of the 12 days of Christmas, yeah, but in exactly. reality, we've got bond options and all these critical turning points. And, and it makes it more like the 13 days of Christmas <laughs> if you're counting all the bond options necessary and all the generosity which Europe is expecting. Okay, let's take the 1st of December. Let's You've okay. got a Spanish auction and a French auction early in December. Then again, December 5th. That's the second day of Christmas. And then yeah. you've got a French auction again for shorter-term bills. Then you've got Irish budget presentations to Parliament. That's on the, the three French hens. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> keep going. Or the Irish hens. Oh, the Irish hens. Yeah. I, and, and then you've got the fourth day of Christmas, Kevin, which is the Greek budget. Yeah. They have to Portugal. vote on that on the seventh, as well as the Portuguese auction yet again, looking right. for money. The fifth day of Christmas, Kevin, you've got the ECB governing council meeting. Well, now that's five golden rings. They may finally get that, and they're probably the just going to cut rates to 1%. That's sort of the expectation is that they're going to be forced to accommodate. Okay. How about the sixth day of Christmas? <laughs> December 9th, as if yeah. we weren't doing anything in early December. Right. The European Council Summit, we mentioned it earlier, this is where they're going to have to decide whether or not they can change and ratify these treaties in right. order to allow for greater fiscal integration. Okay, Dave, the seven swans of swimming, the seventh day of Christmas, which in this case would be December 12th. And the Italian auction for bills, the French auction the same day for bills, and then you've got the December 13th. We'll the call Spanish. that the eighth day of Christmas. Now, that's eight maids of milking. These are Greek maids of milking and Spanish maids of milking. I They're see. looking for treasury bills. The 14th day of December, you've got the Italian auction again for bonds, the Spanish auction for bonds. Right. And Kevin, you're talking about over $100 billion in capital that has to be raised in Europe between now and the end of the year. Maybe it'll be their Black Friday. Maybe people will just come out of the woodwork and just spend money. You've got to believe that they're hoping it, because by the time you get to the 10th day of Christmas, which is the Lord's a-leaping, <laughs> French auction for bonds. I mean, Kevin, it goes on and on, because you've got the Greek auction after that. That's the 11th day. Right. You've got got the Portuguese auction after that on the 21st. We'll call that the 12th day. And, and then this, December 24th, let's call that the 13th day of Christmas. We didn't hit 12, but 13 is probably more appropriate. But before Christmas, you've got a 13th auction, or you know, the Spanish auction for bills. And that's not even the end of the year. You've still got the French auction and the Italian auctions for bills and bonds on the 28th and 29th. Kevin, we are talking about liquidity starvation. We've got institutions here in the United States which are pulling back. If you look at this, there are rings of the subprime all throughout it as institutions are saying listen about our long-standing relationship we love that but 
we're on hold for the time being. The folks upstairs said that we need our money back. That's why we're not extending you any more money for the time being. We'll be right back. That's exactly what happened in 2008, Kevin, where people started to limit the interbank lending. And, Kevin, guess what? The Fed stepped in. The Fed stepped in during 2008 and in a short period of time offered $7.7 trillion into the marketplace to make sure that not only U.S. banks but European banks didn't go under. Kevin, now we have adulterated balance sheets. Now we have more constrained activity by local fiscal authority. Whether you're talking about the Spanish, whether you're talking about the Greek, it's already happened. They can't save themselves. The British can't save themselves. They, right. they may have an issue in Iran. I mean, Kevin, we're just talking about an absolute mess. We're talking about an absolute mess. So this is what I take in over the weekend. And yes, I had a little indigestion from too much turkey. Well, and let's I'm go ahead saying and go all there. Of this is European. Did the turkey cost you more? Because I, th- I think we need to talk about the United States here as we wrap up the show, because there's a lot of people who are well, listening it, to this just, going, just this is one, Europe. One final point, because we come back to the office Monday morning, right? to the cheers of the Wall Street opening bell, and Dow futures are up 250 points, and everyone's ecstatic because people are spending money again, which means there's no problems anywhere else in the world, and there's no possibility for a negative feedback loop from Europe to the United States, because can't you see the consumers out there spending? We're on top of it. Kevin, this is a joke. This is a joke. We're in very, very dangerous territory, in part because people have deluded themselves. Yes, David, it was a mess, but I still had turkey. I still had stuffing. I had cranberry sauce. My wife is an amazing cook. It cost us a little bit more. I don't know about you, but I think somebody actually looked at the statistics. Well, we did last year, and we're looking at it again this year. And, you know, again, in terms of the hedonic adjustment, the question is, how much better was your turkey this year than last year? It was awfully tasty. She had tried new recipes, but it was more expensive. It was more expensive. And did you get more for it, either in terms of poundage or no. pleasure? No, no. Well, then this is the issue. There is a bite with inflation, and there's not something to offset that bite. 13.2% was the total increase in your turkey dinner from this year compared to last year. So, Kevin, that's a sobering reality, but guess what? It doesn't break the bank. The fact that we're spending an extra 5 or $10 more on a turkey dinner when you throw in the 16-pound turkey and the gallon of milk and the pumpkin pie mix yeah, and the whipping cream. Didn't the, relish go down in price? Well, it did, actually. That was the sort of anchor. You had some miscellaneous ingredients in your one-pound relish tray, which was actually down 1.3%. And you got to wonder, is that just the relish that's been sitting in a can for a year and a half, two years, and was up against an expiry date? Dave, at 13.2%, you're right. On a year-to-year basis, you may be able to afford Thanksgiving this year, maybe not next year. But at 13.2%, that means that turkey dinner doubles every five years. Now, what's wrong with the system? You talked about it being a mess in Europe. It's a mess here, and we haven't even had the realization yet, because Europe's been the focus. We haven't had the realization of the mess we're in now. We're worse than Greece. Well, let's finish there, Kevin, because I think when you look at the U.S., you're talking about Recession recognition. Yeah. You know, we've got the backdrop of high unemployment. We've got growth expectations, which are already built into the system. And we think that you could see, as people recognize that we're in recession, not that we ever came up, but we've been in recession and it's been papered over, it's been covered up. The statistics have misled us. Right. Kevin, I think what you're going to find is a several thousand point lower Dow. And you're going to find an S&P who's plumbing the doubt and exploring for the 2009 lows. So are you making a prediction here in in 2012 that we could see the Dow or will see the Dow a couple of thousand points lower than it is right now? Yeah, Kevin, again, I don't respond to the Black Friday weekend bonanza the way the market did. I came in, as you described, with an ashen look on my face and with grave concern making a survival checklist, a financial survival checklist in terms of what about my bank deposits, what about the insurance company, what about pension funds, what about business liquidity, and any advice that we can give to clients. If you are trying to arrange for business liquidity, lines of credit, anything like that, get that done now or you will not have that opportunity January, February of next year. Well, and David, I will say this. It becomes wearisome to look at what's wrong with the world all the time. I mean, we're looking at this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. But what makes something wrong is that it's in contrast to what would be right. And I think what we should encourage our listeners to do as well as looking at what's wrong is say, okay, this is wrong. Do I have to participate in this or is there something that I could make right with this situation? In other words, what's the ideal that we're pursuing? And, you know, you were talking about a checklist. Check your bank deposits. I mean, if a bank is wrong... 
in the way they're investing your money, then you should come out of that bank. Wouldn't you recommend that people even check their bank right now again? Between now and the end of the year, you can call us at 800-525-9556, and any of the folks in our office can give you a free bank safety rating. Anywhere right. in the United States, it does not cover credit unions because they have a different FDIC reporting requirement. They don't have FDIC insurance, so there's a bit of an issue there in terms of the transparency of how they're invested. Right. But banks... Insurance companies. They can check those, too. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and if you ask me where the disaster lies in 2012 and 2013, it's the insurance companies and pension funds mm. because they've not had to seek any reforms. They've not had to clean up their balance sheets at all. Granted, the banks really haven't either, but they've at least gained some liquidity. You've got excess reserves of $1.6 trillion. You can argue that U.S. banks are in a better position today than they were in 2008, given the fact that FASB's not forcing them to disclose toxic assets and write them down. So as long as we can pretend that those things don't exist, our banks are in a healthy place. The place where there's been no reform whatsoever is in the insurance companies yeah. and in pension funds, where they continue to take outsized risks and they continue to swing for the fences. This reminds me of exactly what John Corzine was trying to do in sort of trying to reshape and bolster earnings. How are you going to bolster earnings? By bringing in what he had learned at Goldman Sachs, which is proprietary trading. He wanted that company, MF Global, to be a global force, financial force, trading its own book into the billions and billions and billions so that it could be a cash cow for the owners or the influential within the company. Kevin, he drove it through the floor. He destroyed the company by taking outsized bets and doing it on a leveraged basis. And now people are just standing in line to get their money back. But, Kevin, his basic assumptions were that there was a mispricing of risk hmm. with European paper and that the risk was actually overblown. There was not as much to be concerned about in Europe as the market was pricing in. So he thought he was buying value. And then as the prices of those bonds went lower and the yields went higher, he added to the position, added to the position, added to the position until he had over $11.5 billion exposure. And guess what? When it came for a margin call, guess whose money he used? Yeah. The customer of MF Global. Right, with segregated cash accounts. Kevin, the interesting thing at this particular point will be if people like Corzine get a free pass because of how much support they've given to the current administration. Well, to do a little bit of a background, okay, not only did he run Goldman Sachs. I mean, Kevin, we're talking about fraud. You cannot take money out of someone's segregated account and meet a margin call with it. David, and he is financially have... the largest contributor to the Obama campaign. Okay, it's, it's huge. 2012 campaign. 2004, he made Obama. They said this was the creation of Obama, and it was John Corzine. Yeah, 2008 campaign, of course. I mean, he, you're exactly right. Going back to 2004, he was someone who helped cultivate the persona and brought him into the political limelight. The question is this, who did he give the money to? Because he owed the money to someone, and he made someone else whole at the expense of segregated accounts. Kevin. Nobody's talking about it. Nobody's David. talking about one of the biggest bankruptcies in U.S. history and a man who single-handedly claimed responsibility on October 25th for being overexposed. Will there be ramifications? Or is there political protection, depending on who you make your campaign contributions to? This is what I suggested in our weekly comments Friday, maybe two weeks ago. We have endemic corruption in our political system at a level we have never seen in U.S. political history. Kevin, the question is, will that be cleaned up? Or will that be the status quo from this point forward? Okay, so Dave, we already have established that it's going to be very tumultuous over the next month, maybe the next few days, definitely the next year or two. What is it that we would encourage our listeners to do right now? We talked about staying the course, getting things put in position, and then waiting like we had you know, attributed to waiting for a hurricane. You batten down the hatches. What does that mean? What does the financial triangle or the perspective triangle look like right now? Kevin, okay, let's start on the left side. Growth and income, your equity and bond portfolios. If you're in bonds, you're a fool. I'm sorry, I'm not going to mince words. Right. The stakes are so high in the interest rates in the interest rate and bond market today that if you're sitting there passively collecting your coupon payments and just knowing that if you hold it to maturity, you're going to be fine, you 
will get blistered in this environment. When the interest rates go up. I think 2012, 2013, 2014, this time frame represents the turning of the tide in the interest rate market. And for someone who is not nimble, navigating this as a trader, in today, out tomorrow, you have no business being in the bond market today. And I realize I'm speaking in, in, in a vast generalization. Right. There are good bond positions to hold, but I think the general interest rate environment is caustic and dangerous at this point. Okay, so that moves us to the right side of the triangle, well, the cash side. On the equity side first, because you've got earnings, this reinforces a negative move lower in equities. You look at Jeremy Grantham's comments out last week, Kevin, that we basically have seen a peak in earnings. This has been ideal where you've seen a benefit given higher productivity, laying off of staff and requiring more from your existing people. It sounds like a positive to me, Dave, for the stock market. I mean, if earnings are high right now or better in relation to the stock price. Right. Well, I'm saying is it's as good as it's ever been. Right. And so where do you go from here? And, and Grantham is assuming that we have mean reversion. In other words, if this is as good as it gets, then we also have a bit of average sometime in, in the next 6 to 12 months, which the repricing of equities, you know, again, acknowledging this mean reversion, it puts 2012 as a very negative year for equities. This is where you said we could lose 2,000 points well, in the stock market. And here's the caveat. QE3 adds positive upside potential to equities. Mm. So on the upside, you've got the potential of 2,000 points. On the downside, you've got the potential for a 4,000-point loss on the Dow. Hmm. You tell me if you're comfortable with 2,000 on the upside and 4,000 on the down. Well, it doesn't sound like it makes sense. And I'm not saying there's not upside potential there. I'm just saying that it's only there for the wrong reasons. It's only there with the junkies' infusion of liquidity. Kevin, I think that's where we're at. It's a very tenuous situation. I would not be in equities unless it's a strictly managed portfolio and carefully managed in terms of the risk with offsetting hedges and everything else. So, Kevin, that's a dangerous place to be. The left side of the triangle is fraught with concerns coming into 2012. Okay, and so that leaves me with cash. Obviously, gold is the base. We'll we'll end with the gold, but I mean the cash... Dollars, euros, yuan. I mean, where can a person go right now for paper liquidity? Yeah, that's a real challenge because, on the one hand, you look at the U.S. balance sheet and you say, wait a minute, we're no better off than the Germans, we're no better off than the Greeks, we're no better off than the Spanish or the Italians. It just is a question of perception. And, Kevin, as long as we perceive and the world investment community perceives there being a greater threat with the euro and with the European Union and an unwind of that currency and a lack of clarity as to what happens there, guess who's out of the limelight and guess who gets buoyed in the process? The dollar. I know you guys have been betting on the dollar, even though you don't see the long-term substance of the dollar. Short term, you've had to stay in the dollar with your management. Well, and and if you watch what's happened with foreign currencies, the ones that are commodity-based, which have better balance sheets and a longer-term better play, guess what's happened to them recently? They've all been blistered, Kevin. It's been a very, very ugly go for anyone in New Zealand dollars, Australian dollars, Canadian dollars. Kevin, this is a very difficult environment to be in. And this is where I think investors need to. And the gem from the McCavity interview was this, Kevin. You're going to lose somewhere. Do you have to lose somewhere? Because you can't place all of your eggs in one basket. Because you don't know. You don't have the certainty and the certitude to make that particular bet. If you were in the deflation camp, I gave a speech for the Harry Dent folks a few weeks ago, Kevin, right. down in Florida, and the idea was deflation's the deal. And, and you don't really want exposure to anything except that's going to get positive play in a deflation. Treasuries and dollars, period, full stop, end of story. Kevin, the problem is we don't know. And you've got the inflation camp on the other side who would say, with the clarity of a ringing bell, we know what we know what we know. Sure, QE3, QE4, it's going to be inflation at some point. And that would argue, Kevin, for being in commodities to some degree. That would argue for being in gold and silver to some degree. That would argue for having something that will be inflation or even superinflation boosted. The problem is you don't know with the certainty you think you have. You may think you have certainty. But that means you just haven't studied enough philosophy. Well, Dave, then that does. That takes us to the thing we've been eliminating up to this point in the conversation, and that is this broad, ever-increasing in size base of the triangle in gold. You've brought out in the past inflation or deflation. All you need is instability, and gold really seems to be the only reliable source of preservation of wealth. Kevin, it's actually a hedge against inflation, deflation, political turmoil, geopolitical turmoil. There's so many things, political flight capital, there's so many things that drive the gold market. It's not one element. And, and I think that's of any asset class that makes sense today. And I realize this sounds like a Johnny One Note phrase, but there's only one place that I would go with great confidence, and that would be gold. Even more than silver, 
I like gold. Why? Because I'm afraid that those who love silver love it because it can make them money. And that's the wrong motivation to have in an environment like this where you want to prioritize preservation of capital. I don't care how much money you can make. Ultimately, the silver bugs will win out in the money that they make. But I think the better motivation in this environment is the money that you preserve, not the money that you make. So of the two P's in investing, preservation and profit, you would land solidly on P number preservation. one. Preservation, yeah. absolutely. With profit being a secondary motive, you'll have the opportunity to profit if you preserve and walk out the other side with assets intact. Kevin, we've run two companies now for 40 years or more. And what we do on the wealth management side is really restricted to a particular kind of investor. Right. We have a high minimum. It's something where someone says, we like the way you think and work, we like the way you approach the markets, and we want to partner with you in that. And we have minimum investments there, Kevin, and it's substantial. On the other side, we have no minimum investment. You look at gold and silver, and I remember taking a call back in 2004, a young college student. He was back working on the family farm, running the tractor during the summer months, and he had an extra $400. And he said, Dave, I, you know, I want to do something. What should I be doing? And I said, listen, it costs me more to book this trade in terms of our overhead. It makes no sense for me to book this trade, but we've never had minimums. Why? Because if it's the right thing to do, just do it. I, just do it. And I think, Kevin, looking at 2012, it's very difficult to say with any certainty what will happen. It's very difficult to say politically what the landscape in Europe will look like. At the end of 2012, it's very difficult to say what the political landscape will look like here in the United States. But there is one certainty, that you're not going to go broke owning gold. And if that was the easiest or only decision that you could make, muster the courage to make it. So if you're like the young man on the farm, do something. If you haven't done something, do something, because things are changing. They are changing. They're changing rapidly. And I still have that ashen gray color because I think the environment we're in is the ugliest we may ever see it in our lifetime. Well, you've been listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. You can find us at McIlvaney.com, M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y.com, or give us a call at 800-525-9556. This has been the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. The views expressed should not be considered to be a solicitation or a recommendation for your investment portfolio. You should consult a professional financial advisor to assess your suitability for risk and investment. Join us again next week for a new edition of the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary.